Okay, thank you. Can I uh, begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which we meet and pay my respects to their elders past and present? Can I thank everyone here for coming along to this session, but more broadly to the conference itself? Uh, and I also want to acknowledge the Chifley Research Centre and particularly uh, Jane Austen and all the volunteers that have helped make today possible. Today's a very important day and tomorrow an important weekend for the progressive side of politics. Uh, we need to be casting a broad net when we're looking for ideas as we rebuild our party and today and tomorrow are very important parts of that. Uh, my name's Jim Chalmers. I'm the newly elected member for Rankin, which is a seat just to the south of... <laughs> Thank you. Thanks very much. Seat just to the south of Brisbane in Queensland, uh, and I'm very honoured to be here. My former role was uh, to run the Chifley Research Centre with Jane, so it's a special uh, privilege to be here to introduce such a quality panel of people and to try and guide the discussion that follows. Um, the way it will work is we'll hear um, some, some detailed comments from Patrick Diamond, who I'll introduce in a moment, and then we'll get to what is a really diverse quality um, panel to discuss some of the economic issues that we face on the progressive side of politics. Uh, it's quite a coup to have Patrick Diamond here. Welcome to you, uh, Patrick. Uh, Patrick comes to us from the University of Oxford in the United Kingdom. Some of you may have heard of it. Um, he's, the, uh, he's the vice chair of the P of Policy Network and he's on the advisory board uh, of the Social Market Foundation and they are two of the absolute gold standard think tanks around the world on the progressive side. Uh, he spent a decade working with the Blair and Brown governments in the UK. He became the head of policy planning at number 10, which is a tremendously influential and prestigious job. Uh, and he wrote with the current leader of the Labor Party in the UK, the 2010 Policy Manifesto. He's also a counsellor. He works with volunteer organisations. And most importantly for our purposes today, he's a very well regarded thinker and author around the world. Uh, he's got a number of quality uh, pieces of work to his name. He co-edited uh, a book called Politics After the Crash. Uh, and later this year, we're looking forward to reading Governing Britain, Power, Politics and the Prime Minister, which comes out, as I said, later on this year. He's put a lot of thought into the reasons why the global financial crisis didn't result uh, in a new period of social democratic dominance. Uh, and he, he has some thoughts on what we need to do to rectify that. We've put a lot of pressure on him, as you'll see um, by the title of this session, by asking him for the next big economic idea. Uh, but having read a lot of his stuff, I'm sure he's up to uh, a really quality discussion that will get us thinking, and then we'll go straight from that uh, conversation into a really quality panel. So without further delay, can you please join me in welcoming Patrick Diamond. Well, uh, thanks very much, and um, I think it's fair to say that after those kind words of introduction from Jim, it's probably all downhill from here. But I'll do my best to uh, try to set the uh, terms of the debate that we're going to be having uh, this afternoon. I should begin by saying good afternoon, comrades. Is, do you still use that word in Australia? Is it okay to use that word here? I'm not going to offend anybody. I think there's some, pe there's some people looking at me in a very shocked way at this point in the discussion. But I want to, um, I want to thank very much the Chifley Institute for inviting me, and I want to thank the organisers uh, for making it possible for me to be here. And I do also want seriously to say um, that I bring fraternal greetings from the British Labour Party. Um, our parties have had a proud history of working together on uh, shared challenges. Um, we've been delighted over the years to welcome visitors from the ALP, particularly to our annual conference. And I think that the discussions that we've had between our parties have been of real and enduring value to framing uh, the future of progressive politics in both of our countries. In a sense, the, the working title for my uh, presentation this afternoon is the next big economic idea. But more than that, it is about how centre-left parties can win the battle of ideas. The discussion and the presentation we had this morning uh, from Buffy was tremendously important in terms of setting uh, out ideas about how centre-left parties can campaign effectively. But I believe that our chance of success, our ability to win, our ability to compete in elections is fundamentally framed by our capacity to win the debate about ideas. 
And the goal of centre-left parties must always be to shift the political agenda in a progressive direction. And I want to talk this afternoon about how we can begin to do that again. But before getting to issues of progressive policy ideas, I want to just start by briefly discussing some of the bigger political questions that I think we face. You cannot talk about a progressive economic policy agenda until you understand the political dynamics that all of our parties are currently facing. And I think we have to begin by acknowledging that the current environment is a difficult one and we need a reality check in terms of how we navigate this politically tough environment. Let me begin by saying that I recognise Australia has its own particular challenges. A lot of what I'm going to say this afternoon is based on a broader analysis of the challenges that industrialised societies are currently facing. But I have to, of course, acknowledge that Australia is a particular society, it's a particular economy, it has a particular political context. The ALP, of course, recently lost office, having provided highly competent government which enabled the country to avoid the worst effects of the worldwide economic meltdown that struck after the collapse of Lehman Brothers five years ago. But having been in office for a relatively long period, there is always a danger that attention to the central political story can be lost. The pressure of governing, the burden of incumbency, weakens the sense of a bigger strategic mission. And it's interesting for me to note that a serious post-election debate is now opening up within the Australian Labour Party about the Labour Party's strategic purpose, with a sweep of substantive contributions both from politicians and thinkers on the Australian centre-left. And in a sense, this weekend's conference is another very important contribution to that process. But the challenges are not just ones which are particular to Australia. A second reason why the current environment is a tough one is that while the crisis did impact differently in Australia, we can see a similar fundamental political effect across the world. The financial crisis has not led, in truth, to a resurgence of support for parties of the left. There were many who believed that the collapse of neoliberalism would lead to a renewed faith in social democratic institutions, the active state, Keynesian demand management, and so on. But it has not yet come to fruition. The left has not succeeded in generating as yet, big ideas that offer a decisive step beyond the crisis. The American liberal intellectual Francis Fukuyama recently chastised social democratic parties for failing to offer much distinctive in terms of an alternative conception of how best to organise society and the economy and for no longer championing the interests of the struggling middle class. Now, of course, it takes time for new ideas to emerge, as we saw in the crises of the 1930s and the 1970s, but we have to take this criticism seriously. Fourth, as the former UK Labour Cabinet Minister David Miliband has recently noted, politics and economics are becoming increasingly disconnected. In the 1990s, in the United States, in the United Kingdom, in Australia, in many other industrialised countries, there was a lot of talk about the idea of a third way between old-style social democracy and the new right, which had, it was argued at the time, the potential to reconcile old conflicts. <coughs> Globalisation meant lower inflation and prices. Education promised ceaseless upward mobility. Efficiency and social justice, it was said, uh, now went hand in hand. But in the wake of the economic crash, which began with the collapse of Lehman Brothers five years ago, the political choices facing our parties now seem much more hard-edged. Economically, the logic says be open and embrace international trade. Yet increasingly, in many industrialised countries, the politics says protect what you have and be prepared to go your own way as a country. The West, in general, needs more economic migrants. 
but politically the demand is for greater controls on immigration. The big social challenges require investment in the young, but the most powerful political constituencies are very often older people who understandably wish to protect existing entitlements and benefits. Fifth, the broad mass of working people, both the traditional blue-collar constituencies and the rising middle class, are facing acute pressures, resulting in a compression of incomes and an unprecedented living standards squeeze. I realise that the issues are played out somewhat differently here in Australia, but we do see a similar dynamic emerging across much of the industrialised world. Economic power, of course, is shifting from west to east and often from north to south. Putting jobs under threat, a process accelerated by the 2008 crisis. The knowledge economy is polarising labour markets, leading to a loss of low-skilled jobs, as the weakening of organised labour makes it tougher to protect wages. The resource crunch is driving up commodity prices and the cost of food and fuel. And inequality is rising, even in Australia, since the early 2000s. Impatience with public institutions and public providers that do not deliver value for money and efficiency is therefore also growing. And despite dwindling faith in markets, there has been no tidal wave of support for the state in the wake of the financial crisis, as I've said. So overall then, there is a deep conundrum facing progressive parties across the world. Most voters do want more choice and control over their lives, but they also want to be protected from the insecurities which are generated by globalisation, by technological change, and by economic restructuring. And it is to that conundrum that I believe centre-left parties have to speak. We also have to acknowledge that we face these tough challenges in a world where faith in politics itself has been diminished. We have to accept that parties, progressive parties even, are too often seen as narrow cliques, ruled by big money. The apparent lack of big ideas is also cited as a reason for more political disengagement. The political class, in truth, is often seen as unrepresentative. And in a number of countries, we have seen emerging a process of governing, where politicians seem determined to give power away to regulators and to technocrats. But the only way out of this malaise, at least in my view, is to engage voters in the bigger choices and trade-offs that our societies face. We have to get away from the consumerisation of politics by demonstrating that messy and uncertain as the political process always is, politics is still the best hope of improving our world. Now for centre-left parties, the basic political strategy has not changed. It is to create an enduring alliance between middle-class society and those most in need, the jobless, the economically excluded, the most disadvantaged. In Britain, the great Labour victories of 1945, 1964 and 1997 were all delivered by forging a progressive alliance between the so-called haves and have-nots around the idea of ending insecurity through the collective institutions of the welfare state while fashioning an opportunity society. Now, achieving that in today's world is tough politically, for reasons I've already mentioned. But the central political goal remains the same, to forge a new progressive coalition, what the current UK Labour leader, Ed Miliband, refers to as a one-nation Labour politics. So in the light of these political challenges, and in the light of this strategic need to create an enduring progressive alliance between the middle class and those who are struggling, the goals of an effective progressive economic, political and policy strategy are threefold. First, we have to achieve sustainable, inclusive economic growth, which creates rising incomes across the board and which creates the conditions for full employment. Second, we have to redistribute market incomes and assets to help the most disadvantaged, while ensuring that the middle class rather than the super rich get their fair share of rising prosperity. And the third goal is to ensure...